Okay, um, just to say uh, hello and uh, indeed uh, good evening if you're watching from the UK and uh, good afternoon if you're watching from uh, the States. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special presentation entitled uh, An Atlantic Life, James Logan of Lurgan, Bristol and Philadelphia. My name is David and uh, I'll be your host uh, for this evening, um, right from the comfort of my home here in Lurgan. Um, this talk is being hosted as part of the Lurgan Townscape Heritage Initiative. Um, which is supported by the RMA City, Banbridge and Craigavon Borough Council and the National Lottery Heritage Fund. The Townscape Initiative has two major objectives. Uh, firstly, to uh, repair and restore and regenerate uh, a number of historic buildings within the Lurgan Town Centre. And secondly, to promote the history and heritage of Lurgan, including all the people, events and places that have contributed to the town looking the way that it does today and have shaped the town's history over the years. In tonight's presentation, we're going to be looking at one of Lurgan's most famous sons, James Logan. Now, if you uh, have grew up in Lurgan or you've, uh, you know, uh, are very familiar with the town, James Logan is a name that will ring a bell, even if you're not entirely sure who he is. Um, the reason being that at the very top of the town, or the bottom of the town, at the, at the bottom of High Street, there's a lovely, very striking blue plaque attached to the wall of the Quaker building, uh, the Quaker buildings. The blue plaque itself uh, records uh, very simply that near this site, James Logan, 1674, 1751, president of the Council of Pennsylvania was born. This plaque sort of tells us a couple of things. Firstly, that James Logan was born in Lurgan. Secondly, that its attachment to a, a Quaker building would indicate that he was perhaps a Quaker, and that this area of the town was synonymous with the Quakers. And thirdly, that he achieved a measure of greatness in the United States in Pennsylvania. Put all of that together, and you certainly have a story to tell. But I have to say it's a story that I haven't really heard told in its entirety, um, only in bits and pieces. So we're hoping tonight's uh, talk will um, we'll tell that story and we'll uh, put some meat onto the bones of uh, this uh, man, who he was and what did he do. To tell the story, we're delighted to welcome uh, Laura Kime uh, from Philadelphia due to the magic of uh, Zoom. Um, Laura is the curator of Stanton, uh, the house that uh, uh, James Logan's house in Philadelphia from I think around 1730. Um, yep. Okay. Um, remember the date? Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Stanton today is recognised as a historic, uh, as, a, as a landmark in, um, in, in the United States, and it operates as an historic house attraction. In addition to her curatorial responsibilities, uh, Laura is also a lecturer. Um, in the uh, graduate program of preservation at the University of Pennsylvania. And she has a great interest in architecture, decorative arts, and the material culture of the British and North Atlantic world in the 18th and early 19th century, topics which she's written very widely on. Um, now that I've embarrassed you there, Laura, I think I'll stop, <laughs> stop embarrassing you, but uh, um, I'd just like to say thank you very much for uh, joining, joining us today for, uh, to provide this presentation. It's uh, certainly something we'll be looking very, very forward to. Um, just before we start, just, uh, just to sort of say the presentation will last around about uh, 40 minutes or so. It will then be followed by a 15 to 20 minute uh, uh, question and answer session. If uh, during the course of uh, Laura's presentation, there's a question that springs to mind or there's something you'd like uh, we have more information about, um, simply click the Q&A button, at, which is at the very bottom of your screen, and uh, type your question and press send. And then myself or uh, Rachel or Tony will pick that up and uh, we will then uh, present that question um, during the question and answer session. Um, I think that's everything I have to say. I don't think uh, I can't think of anything else. So um, I'll uh, just hand over to you, Laura, if you're happy enough uh, to take over. Sure. Thank you very much, David, for that very kind introduction and this invitation. Uh, it's really a lot of fun to explore the, Log the uh, Lurgan side of Logan's life and um, to, to just try and understand a little bit more about his early context. Um, so I entitled this talk An Atlantic Life um, simply because 
Uh, it's it's the Atlantic itself and the trade that happened in the Atlantic that allowed Logan to become who he did ultimately, and a kind of going back and forth that he he did go back and forth um, more than once, but also this back and forth of trade and goods that um, allowed him to to both gain the wealth that would would allow him to purchase a plantation and, and build a new house, as well as furnish it with um, goods from both Philadelphia and um, back in, in England. So I'm just showing you here a detail of his portrait, um, an image of the front facade of Stenton, uh, one of the chairs in the house, which has a kind of Anglo-Irish um, design and um, an example of a floral print. He was very um, interested in botany, but a floral print that he ordered about 1730 as a, as a whole series of a calendar prints um, from London. So part of these, this Atlantic life involved um, mentoring people close to home in Pennsylvania, like um, the young Benjamin Franklin or the botanist John Bartram, but also corresponding with Peter Collinson, um, a Quaker merchant in London with whom he exchanged um, many ideas and um, books and objects, which we'll, you'll see, and um, Linnaeus, the great plantsman, whom um, would name a whole genus of plants for Logan. But I'm just going to use as a starting point an object that recently arrived at Stenton in 2018, and this detail of one of its faces is maybe the only thing um, present on the site that someone could encounter and realize right away that Logan was born in Ireland in memory of James Logan and the dates, um, so analogous to the blue plaque, but born at Lurgan, Ireland, died at Stenton, Pennsylvania. And this bronze memorial was created in 1939 and stood outside a building that held um, in large measure many of James Logan's books in um, on South Broad Street in Philadelphia at the Library Company of Philadelphia. And um, it actually was in storage for many years and recently came to Stenton and has sparked some recent kind of monumental, monumentally grounded pro projects that we've, we've been pursuing, um, bringing on this monument of someone who owned enslaved people um, really in, in America at this time particularly had given us pause to think how can we um, put this, this memorial in conversation with other parts of our history um, of, of Logan as an enslaver at Stenton into, into the landscape. And we are building a new memorial to a once enslaved woman named Dinah at Stenton. But here's a transcription of, again, this more full biography of Logan on the front face. Um, I mentioned that born at, born at Lurgan died at Stenton, friend of William Penn, mayor of Philadelphia, 1722, chief justice of the Supreme Court and president of the council, 1731 to 39, acting lieutenant governor of the province, 1736 to 38, and then founder of the Loganian Library now housed in this building, of course, the library is now is still at the Library Company of Philadelphia. So his nearly 3,000 volumes of books are not at Stenton, but um, have moved moved downtown. So we've also planted near this um, memorial the only um, sort of member of the Loganiaceae genus that can grow in our climate, the Spigelia marilandica. So there's the plaque that that David mentioned. And I just wanted to um, sort of put out there this quote that is in um, James Logan's biography by Frederick Tolles published in the 1950s. And it's probably still one of the most accessible, although unfortunately not footnoted um, sources on Logan. He says, in the days that should have been my gayest, I knew nothing out of school but terror and horror. And I, I mentioned this to David that I've been thinking about um, what that meant in terms of being a Quaker in the, in the late 17th century and um, his family actually moving to Lurgan to escape persecution in, um, in Scotland where he 
um, I'm sorry, they, they, they moved to Scotland to, um, why am I getting so confused? Um, Born in Lurgan, moved to Scotland. No, I'm, So at any rate, I just wanted to get back to this, this sense that as a young man, he felt, um, what, to, to use the words terror and horror, that there's a certain trauma that he probably felt about being a young Quaker. So I, I know I'm confusing myself because his parents are from Scotland and I'm going to show you a map shortly that will, um, We'll make that clear. But this is this this notion of his father um, having actually been a, um, an, a, a practicing minister in in the formal church, then um, converting to Quakerism and and the family moving to Ireland. So back just to that plaque, and I thought it might be fun for particularly the Americans in the audience just to orient a little bit to Lurgan, where this, um, this plaque is on the side of a, a building, as David mentioned, and that is, he, this, um, this map of Lurgan highlights this sort of Quaker site, this town center area, and a little, in a little bit more detail, the current Quaker meeting house, a, a Quaker graveyard that is a different one from one I'll show you some photos of in just a moment, and, um, the what they call the second Quaker meeting house I'll show you in a moment too but this plaque is is just here on this building and then you're looking toward this second Quaker meeting house that's been retired the first one um, the Logans would not have known they'd already moved to Bristol England at the time that this was built in 1696 at somewhere quite close to where this second one is um, built 1882 and used until 1996. So outside of um, Lurgan is the Linus Town burial ground. And here in an unmarked grave is one of um, James Logan's siblings, Hannah Logan. His parents had quite a number of children, um, but only he and his brother, William, who would become Dr. William Logan of Bristol, survived to adulthood. So when Lo Logan was 13, he was apprenticed to um, a linen merchant, Edward Webb in Dublin. So he was learning about the textile um, trade at, at, from a young age. And here to unconfuse myself is this um, contemporary map of um, Stenton near Edinburgh, no, I'm not even like I'm not I'm at the wrong spot of the map. Stenton near Edinburgh, for which Logan would name the house, um, and Lurgan just above this um, inland freshwater lake in Northern Ireland, and then Bristol here at the juncture of the rivers Avon and Severn in the west of England. So um, his parents' journey with Logan as a young boy to Ireland, and then as a teenager moving to Bristol, where his father uh, also ran, ran a school. And this map is meant to just represent this sense of the kind of Atlantic life. This is um, of the, the period when Logan would have been traveling from the British Isles to um, the East Coast of North America, to Pennsylvania. And he traveled at the invitation of William Penn in 1699 to then serve as colonial secretary. Um, and we, we haven't really understood a lot about how this came to pass, really exactly how Logan and uh, Penn would have met, but it probably happened in Bristol when Logan had taken over, um, after Logan had taken over his father's school. And Stanton had the opportunity now more than a decade ago, um, to purchase some Logan documents at auction, one of which is this letter written in June of 1699 by Quaker merchant Richard Stafford, 
responding to an earlier letter in, um, from Logan about his decision to accept Penn's offer to travel to Pennsylvania to be secretary. And Logan received this letter at William Penn's house in Warminghurst in Sussex. And clearly Stafford really wanted Logan to stay on and join his um, firm, his mercantile firm, and says, the consideration of thy design of settling among us, especially as a partner was very highly pleasing and acceptable to me. And ultimately, and a little bit begrudgingly, Stafford concludes, and now I can truly say, I most heartily and sincerely congratulate the propitiousness of thy fates. And Logan would set sail from Portsmouth aboard the Canterbury with Penn and his family in September of 1699, arriving in this version of Pennsylvania, um, which does the north is actually off to the right of this map. But um, you get the, the sense this is New Jersey and the Delaware River here dividing these two um, co uh, colonies and the major creeks and rivers that intersect. So early Philadelphia, um, this is the South Prospect uh, of the city by Peter Cooper sort of about 1718. And you can see that it was this, this bustling port with ships and uh, a growing population of houses and public buildings and churches. So when Logan arrived, um, he primarily lived in this building, the Slate Roof House for a number of years with other merchants in the city as a bachelor, focusing on um, trade and moving, uh, being a mover and shaker in the colony on behalf of William Penn. Um, and he would have known, this is a, a 1930s recreation of Penn's, um, Pennsbury Manor House up the river, Delaware, up the Delaware River in Bucks County, but Logan certainly knew this, this hit house as well. Um, so his life probably revolved very much about around um, the, the coffee houses. This is actually the exterior of Philadelphia's old London coffee house that's um, a little younger than, than Logan would, would, have, would have been. And that is where again, he lived with other merchants, including Isaac Norris. Um, and he, Isaac Norris was from another Quaker from Jamaica. And a lot of their trade would be this kind of um, triangle trade and engaged much um, trade with the Caribbean because of uh, Norris's connections. And ultimately, this is another, um, although quite faded, a document in Stenton's collection of um, the marriage between Isaac Norris's son, Isaac, and James Logan's daughter, Sarah. And some of the witnesses include um, members of the Griffiths family who were also I believe um, Lurgan associated Quakers. But Logan made a lot of his fortune um, trading, he, he called himself a, a bear skin merchant. Um, and so trading in, in furs, his accounts of peltry throughout his, his accounts are where kind of quite a lot of his um, income was ultimately focused and he would ship furs across the Atlantic um, in exchange for goods that often might wind up in the hands of Native Americans. Um, so the Native Americans did the trapping and there were these traders, um, sort of middlemen that Logan dealt with, and then um, goods that Logan would provide like knives and jaws harps and rings and awls and tobacco boxes and screw boxes and flints, um, rum and so forth. And, and, in exchange um, for, the, for the furs. He also supplied quite a lot of um, strouds and other kinds of blankets and things that were coming out of um, England. And perhaps um, in my own experience, my, um, my best insight into Logan because I'm, I'm really interested in, in Stenton as a house and um, its material culture has been digging around in James Logan's 1720s ledger book that survives at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. And you can see here, Philadelphia, a count of my plantation and um, just the many entries and pages that it's very much a tremendous insight into 
um, the Atlantic economy going in and out of Philadelphia at this time. And um, Logan uh, educated his children, his daughters, Hannah and Sarah, um, attended Elizabeth Marsh's school in Philadelphia, which was no um, small investment on his part to have his daughters well educated. And he sent his son, William, to England to school in Bristol, where his uncle William could kind of keep an eye on uh, William and his progress. So here's cash paid for Billy's schooling. The Stenton is actually located um, inland a bit and north of Philadelphia. It's a, a, you could say it's a kind of landlocked plantation and Logan regretted actually that it did not have a fine prospect or a great view. Um, but it's at the juncture of two important old roads. The Germantown road here was known as the Great Road and was an old Indian trail headed in toward the frontier. And then the York Road, this road that run, runs northward to New York. And so this put, positioned Logan at an important intersection, intersection for trade and news that um, Stenton here would become a, a kind of natural stopping point five miles north of Philadelphia. And this is the, the main city on the grid between the Delaware and Schuylkill Rivers here. And in Logan's time, it really was just pretty much a city right against um, the Delaware River. And this is a projected plan that was ultimately filled in. And in 1854, the entire city of Philadelphia is incorporated. So even beyond the borders of this map, um, now are all the city of Philadelphia and Stanton is, is within city limits. But to give you a sense for kind of the landscape of Stenton today in scale, and Logan's Stenton, this is laid over a, a city, a contemporary city map. So you can see the grid that exists now, but these were um, the Stenton acres and a bit here added in fact by um, Logan's son, William at later, a later date. And then this little bit references the two and a half acres that the National Society of Colonial Dames of America and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania um, administer as a historic site with the house and a service wing, a late 18th century barn, a log house moved to the property as a caretaker's residence and a colonial revival garden. And we've installed that memorial um, down in this, this area. So I mentioned, um, when we we're talking about the memorial, in fact, that Logan did own um, slaves. And this is in his account of Negroes in the le same ledger book that I showed you. Um, and the trade seemed to primarily be through Charleston, South Carolina. Um, probably the people that came to Stenton had been in the Caribbean for some time before then coming to Philadelphia. And this is the house that Logan would break ground on in 1730. He began to acquire the land um, in 1714 at the same time that he married Sarah Reed. Um, and if you do some reading about Logan, one of the things that many of the writers seem to dwell on is that he had trouble finding a wife. And in fact, one of the women he wanted to marry was um, ended up married to his friend, Thomas Story. And then he also, uh, courted a, a woman in England for a while whose family thought he was just a colonial, um, but ultimately he married the much younger Sarah Reed, and they would have four children survive to adulthood altogether. And they moved into this house um, in 1730. After Logan had fallen on the ice in Philadelphia in 1728 and um, broke his hip, so he was actually um, in a crippled state the entire time he would live here until his death then in 1751. Um, originally, the house had a small pediment over the door and side lights, a balustrade at the top of the hip of the roof, and it had a cupola on top as well that we've continued to have questions about whether it might have served as a kind of observatory for Logan if he could be carried uh, up that far. 
And I mentioned um, Logan was a, a great book collector and these three windows on the second floor primarily form um, a room that was known as the blue lodging room where his books were housed during his lifetime. And the other room, um, uh, the best bedchamber, which I will we'll show you pictures of um, on this, this sort of quick visit to Stenton and some of the Logan related objects. Um, one of the things that has, has often struck us, be, particularly because visitors mentioned it, um, maybe not even quite a handful of times, but that the six windows across the front of the house are an unusual configuration in a house like this, that the house is often five bays wide, the bays being stacks of windows with a central feature, a central window. And um, some people have commented that they've seen houses in Ireland that have the same arrangement. And so David kindly put me in touch with um, Philip Smith, an architectural historian, who really couldn't say that he felt this was anything other than accommodating probably the owner's desire for this particular arrangement of these two large chambers across the second floor inside. Um, so that's still an outstanding question. And I certainly invite if anyone knows houses, any of, of those of you who are in Ireland know houses with six windows across the second floor, I am very curious uh, just to know about that. Uh, and originally the house also had a kind of forecourt, which has been somewhat archeologically investigated in recent years. So here are just a couple of um, frontispieces from, from some, and um, notes, Logan's own notes inside his, um, his books. He could actually, um, he was inc very interested in, in mathematics um, and uh, critiqued Newton's Principia in his own. He went through it line, you know, line by line and, and drew his own critiques inside the book. And um, he knew um, Arabic as well, um, Greek and Latin and Hebrew, French. Um, so, and he, he's said to have, have been able to converse with um, Native Americans in the Algonquin language and had an Algonquin uh, Bible in, in the library as well. Um, and I'm also just showing you a, um, a book title page, Cato Major, or his discourse of old age with explanatory notes that Benjamin Franklin printed for Logan in his, uh, his later years. And it, it's meant to make fun of Logan for his aging eyes and needing this large print of old age so that he would be able um, to read the book. And I also just wanted to briefly mention that um, Logan, from a, bi a bot botanical standpoint, is best known for his um, studies of maize or Indian corn, as we also know it, um, for proving the, the sexuality of plants and how the, the pollen was transferred through the wind through a series of experiments. And this is pu was published in Leiden in 1739 as well. And that, that is one of his kind of... Um, scientific claims to fame. And then I'm also just showing you a small sketch um, for Logan's own design for the library building where he intended his library to go after his death with this kind of somewhat temple-like classical form. And it was indeed built and the library went there until the 1780s when it joined this other institution, the Library Company of Philadelphia that Benjamin Franklin had founded in 1732 with other craftspeople. And Logan clearly thought his library at the time was above the library of the craftspeople. So I mentioned that Logan really made a lot of his, his money through trade with Native Americans. And one of the things he did on behalf of William Penn and the, later the Penn Sons was help to negotiate treaties. And um, I'm showing you four Indian kings who traveled to London in 1710 to pledge their allegiance to Queen Anne um, as painted by Jan Brelst um, at that time. And they were much feted about London. Um, those paintings were made, prints were then made, and these were um, disseminated to people like Logan who were provincial counselors. Um, and I, I don't really, other than um, knowing that other high ranking colonial officials 
might have these prints. I don't have proof that Logan did, but perhaps this object from an archeological um, dig at Stenton in 1982, um, maybe helps to cement this notion that, that Logan did have these prints. And um, this is one of the only things in our collection we're able to show the public that direct, directly talks about Logan's um, engagement with Native Americans. But in the 17, late 1730s and early 1740s, um, he received kind of whole encampments of Iroquois from the upstate New York region prior to treaties in Philadelphia. And perhaps this bowl played some role in that. So he also was, uh, and reflected in his library too, he's very interested in, in the ancient world and the classics and um, was very proficient in his Latin. And clearly his father as a schoolmaster had taught him well and um, Logan would continue to pass that along to the students he taught as a young man in Bristol. Um, but this probably was one of his treasured objects. And it's another one of these things that we, it came down through the family and um, ha has this connection that it was presented to Logan by Peter Collinson. And we've tried to trace this backward and don't have an, a really nice, totally lined up documentary trail, but we do believe it's quite likely that this is true, that Peter Collinson sent this um, Greek skiffos to Logan, which makes it the first known piece of classical pottery to be owned by a North American. Um, so he didn't have a whole huge kind of cabinet of curiosities, but he had a few um, things he probably thought of in that vein. And in, in addition to the skiffos, it may have included, there are only four shown here, but a whole collection of marble samples from um, the classical world as well that have individually um, wrapped envelopes that, that label them. So you might be familiar with things like specimen tables from people who would take grand tours. And um, so rather than, than having something as elaborate as that and unable to ever take the grand tour, Logan had his kind of little collection of marble samples. We know he had a telescope, though this is not his. Um, I wish we knew more about where his scientific equipment is. And one aspect of my job is actually really tracing Logan, Logan objects. And you'll see how we've um, been tracking them and, and try to bring things back to the house, either by gift or purchase or loan, um, so that the number of things that directly reflect the Logan family has increased in recent decades. Um, and Logan also had a pair of globes. So I'm just showing you this, this ground floor, floor plan of the house. Um, not, not so atypical like the six windows upstairs, but a discrete entry space, more common um, in the UK than, than in um, the colonies or in America. And um, the best parlor uh, I'll be showing you shortly, a, a space we think that Logan probably used as a gentleman's office, a large back dining room, which is um, sort of a more family room and an everyday space, and then a rear first floor lodging room. Here's the entry. And um, with the, the doors closed, it really is a discreet room. It's heatable by the fireplace and has a paved um, brick floor. And something that tends to jump out in the entry are these um, drop pendants with hearts over the doors. And this may be a kind of quiet, maybe you might say possibly, this is an interpretation, but a Quakerly allusion um, to this Logan coat of arms and um, the heart pierced by three nails with a stag's head crest. This is drawn by Logan's uh, grandson's wife, Deborah Norris Logan. These are the chairs I mentioned, and I'll have a closer look, but in a few moments. But this, um, these veneered seat fronts are quite unusual, in, actually, in Philadelphia and, and um, American chairs. But these are otherwise fairly typical-looking kind of um, second quarter of the 18th century 
uh, early Georgian side chairs. And there were tables stored in the hall that could be also used in the parlor. And um, this is meant to show you too, the degree to which this is Richard Champion. Um, he is a, a brazier and merchant from Bristol and quite a lot of the fittings for the house um, came from Bristol, all the hardware, um, the hinges and so forth and glass, which was always a challenge to ship glass, tiles, ceramic fireplace tiles, tin glaze tiles. And, and then for the finishing of the interior, the paint was all um, imported as well. You can see white lead, red ochre, stone ochre, and so forth. So actually some of these images will give you um, a view of, so we've, we've evolved, we continue to evolve the presentation of the house over time. And we have a different looking glass here now, but this is the, the parlor. And the house survives really quite intact. Um, it was uh, lived in by the fam by members of the family to the 1860s. Um, then tenant, tenant farmers were there kind of at the end of the 19th century for a bit. And then the colonial dames actually took it on as a historic site project uh, in 1899. So it wasn't ever lived in by people who desired to update it with kind of gas or electricity or plumbing, which is a great blessing when you're working with a historic house and um, wanting to represent its 18th century life. But we also use um, English conversation pieces of the 18th century to help us imagine um, life in some of these spaces. Uh, with, with the Logan. So this is the Goff family and Goff was an East India company director and not a bearskin merchant from Pennsylvania. But you get the sense for a, a stone colored parlor with Georgian chairs, a tea table, um, some a silver service, ceramics, his desk and bookcase. And you can help sort of imagine um, what life was like at Stenton in the 18th century. This was one piece that may have been, um, could have been James Logan's, but also does not have a very um, nice lined up tight provenance, but it is a, a very heavy mahogany and has these exotic wood inlays. Looking back toward the fireplace wall at the buffet and a looking glass that we have on loan now that came down in the family as well. And as I mentioned, very few things have been changed, um, but the fireplace tiles that were originally in here were replaced in the 1950s with, uh, by the colonial dames. And here's a representation of the original. And um, it took me quite a while of working at Stenton before hovering over the uh, James Logan's estate inventory taken after his death to really come to terms with the fact that the parlor was used as the dining room, that the knives and forks were stored in there and that the tables would be pulled in and out. And this buffet was filled with um, the chinaware. And it's just amazing actually, um, the archeological dig from 1982 that I mentioned uh, has allowed us to really mend things and um, refill that buffet with family um, ceramics. There was also um, quite a lot of silver. So um, 329 ounces when James Logan died, including his um, assembled London made tea service and a, a really massive Philadelphia tankard that's now at the Philadelphia Museum. These are all at the Philadelphia Museum of Art as is this uh, coffee pot. So just some examples of the, these mended wares. And we've been just very lucky to have archaeological expertise um, on and available to our team over the last decade or so. But you can see a combination of, of Chinese porcelain of various sorts and sizes, as well as English salt glazed stoneware and um, several creamware. And even we think a locally made little redware tea bowl that could have been used by the servants. And these are the, the mending process at work. 
some more examples and then things that also survived with the family above ground, such as that small teapot and this jar um, and some of the um, plates here from descendants as well, give us really quite a full assemblage and uh, um, family members who really valued things that did come down to them and, and labeled things, Logan, China from Stenton, Philadelphia and, um, and, and Jane Caroline Armat Logan. This is, this is a her, she's a late 19th and early 20th century descendant. And this, this parlor really served as a kind of stage. So you think about this kind of Atlantic life happening where merchants gather in the counting house and then they entertain at home um, and transpire business, marry off their daughters and so forth. These scenes happen in parlors such as the one at Stenton. And um, this is the, the buffet, the service doors on the far sides, and one that we think has been altered, but was a dumbwaiter closet originally. So this was a, was a straight shelved closet that could be loaded from inside this corridor with piping hot food to then be served um, on, at, at, the, at the table without servants having to go in and out of that passage constantly. But you get the sense for the theatricality of all of this that you can um, exit and enter uh, from all the food can sort of magically appear from, from the back. Oops. And just um, to show how food service worked here, this led, leads out to a no longer extant original kitchen. The back dining room has a large fireplace that could be used for warming and a cupboard for serving and then into that dumbwaiter closet to the best parlor. And this is that back dining room with its um, serving closet here and warming fireplace. And in contrast to all that porcelain that you saw in the parlor, the back dining room was filled with pewter. There were over 60 pewter plates and we've slowly been bringing um, more pewter back to the house, either by gift and and loan. And this is again, kind of showing the pride, I think that many Logan descendants have had over, um, over the centuries in their ancestor. This is a James Logan era plate that as it was handed down in his, um, his daughter Hannah's line to the Smiths, uh, subsequent generations would either add their ciphers and in more recent years, they've continued to um, list owners. The present owner here was born in 1946 and he does live in the UK. Um, these are some bottles from that archaeological collection, uh, all of which originally had Logan's seal. And these are locally made probably of um, South Jersey glass from the Wisterberg glass works in New Jersey. And another object we um, never would have thought about, it's not an inventoried object from when Logan died, but um, came to our attention and um, it was offered to us actually by an antiques dealer. And so we just, we went on a fundraising spree because this was James Logan's Tinder lighter. It's quite large actually, and um, it's simply to generate a spark. So it's a quite elaborate um, and beautifully engraved way to do that. And you, so you can imagine, again, Logan would have been crippled. So sometimes you have to really kind of reinsert that notion into thinking and imagining about his life at Stenton, but this group of gentlemen um, relaxing, some of them with their wigs off, um, being waited on imbibing and enjoying their drink. And we are really fortunate to have quite a number of um, Logan objects that have been in the collection a long time, like this small gate leg table made in Philadelphia. This is the close up I mentioned of these chairs and there are four of these known, but they have this um, sort of dovetailed construction to the way the legs fit together, which is also um, a much more English and less common kind of Philadelphian way of assembling chairs. And some have suggested that these C scrolls under the knees are again, a more Irish trait, um, as well as this is Logan's easy chair, which is not, not at Stenton, these sort of slipper feet with these kind of um, uh, 
tongues that run up to the ankle and the triffid feet of this Logan family settee that's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art with shell carved knees. And again, those sea scrolls. Um, and this is a particularly singular form in American furniture and Philadelphian furniture of this period. So if it looks particularly Irish to any of you listening, I'm interested to know. And other things kind of continued to, cut to, um, to come to our attention and we're hoping to borrow this chair soon. It was William Penn's chair given to Logan. It had kind of fallen apart in the attic at Stenton and um, James Logan's grandson's wife passed it along to an antiquarian collector who kept its, its provenance intact and it became part of the city's collection and is now at a National Independence Historical Park. Um, this cane seated stool. And it may in fact be um, that Logan himself added the leather or a version of the leather when the cane wore out. I mentioned the looking glass and looking glasses were one of the things he imported in, in quantities. And then his library, his books really would have been the most specialized um, personal and important objects to him that, that he, um, that he collected over his, he collected all over his whole adult life, although he had to sell his books to pay his passage, initial passage to Pennsylvania. And um, ultimately there was a, a book he was able to buy back to his collection, his very own volume that so pleased him um, that he could do that. But I'm showing you a bookcase that was built to fit this upstairs bedchamber at Stenton where Logan um, held his books and on it are simply books acting as props but on the right as proof that Logan actually really read his books extensively and and wore them are his re his books from his library are, are largely rebound and are in 19th century bindings because of um, the hard use that they received in his lifetime there are just a couple of his account of books with some um, record of, of shipments and, and trade, and then his memorandum to his, uh, one of his London factors also listing book titles. But there's quite extensive correspondence in the Logan collection for his um, buying and selling of books. And he's always wanting to make sure that the price is, is, is excellent and very concerned about that as well. His watch um, survives here in Philadelphia and is not, is not in our collection. And I mentioned the flower pictures that um, the glass for these was also ordered from the champions in Bristol. And we don't know for sure that, um, that these were the exact um, ones, but the, the, he's so specific about the size of the window glass that it matches this set of prints. And then the upstairs plan of the house. Um, so the, the staircase, the double wide staircase takes up quite a, a, a lot of space and is really very much a status symbol in and of itself. And leaves, leads the public on this procession to this, um, through another set of double doors to this grand bedchamber. And these are the six windows that I mentioned on the second floor. So the blue lodging room um, being primarily where Logan's books were housed. And this yellow lodging room also is a relatively recently now, a few years, um, completed restoration project for us where we, we did um, paint analysis, we did um, oops, color analysis of, of this quilt and looked to the, uh, this is a reproduction of that Logan settee at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, looked to the original for um, color evidence so that this room ended up being really a color study in this old fustic, this kind of golden um, color with a bit of a reddish hue and a series of maple furniture. So the room originally had 12 maple chairs and this is James Logan's maple high chest and dressing table that came down through the family and were left by bequest. Um, sorry, I keep bumping that button, but you cannot see in this image, but there are hooks, original hooks in the ceiling and in all the bed chambers at Stenton. And so hence we're able 
this is a, a flying tester bedstead that doesn't have posts and that tester is, is um, partially suspended from the ceiling. And it took my own uh, Atlantic journeys to really begin to understand what this would have looked like. And one of the first primary bits of evidence for, for me was looking at these flying tester bedsteads in a dollhouse that's um, in the care of the National Trust in the UK. So um, Logan's life was so oriented toward, toward England that for him, I don't think he thought of his house as necessarily colonial or anything other than what a provincial sort of merchant of his status would, would have. But we did research looking to other um, examples, antiquarian William Stukeley's own drawing of his best bed chamber also provided, this is his flying tester bedstead and sconces, looking glasses with sconce arms, just like Logan had on his inventory. And I'm showing you here this slightly better close-up images of this local maple high chest and dressing table made in Philadelphia. And we think for the room, probably about 1738. And as I'm Drawing toward a close, I, I wanted to show you a portrait that also has gone back and forth across the Atlantic, um, but it was painted here in Pennsylvania of Logan's daughter, um, Sarah, Sally, and um, actually it has been in the possession of, a, of multiple generations of Logan descendants in England. And um, sadly it's by bequest, but um, we've been, been gifted this portrait that is going to make an, its, its Atlantic journey um, back to Stenton in the near future. And Logan talks about, again, about um, how much he admires his, his eldest daughter. Besides her needle, she's been learning French. And this last week has been very busy at the plantation in the dairy in which she delights as well in spinning, but is at this moment at the table with me being first day afternoon and her mother abroad, reading the 34th Psalm in Hebrew, the letters of which she has learned perfectly in less than two hours time. So it says that she's, she's required to learn all the things that women learn to run their households, like spinning and working in the dairy. But she has a really good mind too. And he quite admi clearly admired that about her. And it's in thinking about his, his successors, his children, um, that Logan commented on the notion of Americanness. Perhaps the lateness of this, our settlement, will scarcely allow men to account it their country because they remember that they were born and bred up in another. Whilst our estates and families are here, meaning in America, while our children are born and must subsist here, it becomes truly ours and our children's country, and it is our duty to love it, to study and to promote its advantages. And this is in 1723. So this is about the time that uh, Logan is breaking ground on, it, on, his, on Stenton, on his house, and he's literally planting himself. He's gonna, he's gonna do it. He's gonna live here. He's gonna stay in uh, Philadelphia. and and call it his own. Um, but I would argue he probably, he died in 1751 and I'm not sure he ever would have envisioned um, the colonies going independent and um, ultimately forming a whole new country. I don't think that he, he could have foreseen this. And by all accounts, he's, um, you know, he, he gets to do what he wants ultimately in terms of collecting his books and having time for his scholarship, but he never does take himself um, completely out of politics and trade. He's a, he's, he strikes me as someone who is a, a very intense and particular and, and just so brilliant that probably there were very few people who could kind of really interact with him in um, the intense way that that he found sort of most, most engaging. Um, and so I, I just returned to that quote that I mentioned in the beginning that he knew terror and horror in school and whether some of his ultimate desire to come to Pennsylvania or the fact that he, he sought out um, kind of 
wealth and security um, and to be in a Quaker place, despite one of the other things we could talk about in the question and answer period, perhaps is that he's not always seen as the best Quaker. He's certainly, he's not a pacifist. Um, but whether the, these experiences of that sense of terror and horror in his youth, um, perhaps feeling persecuted for his Quakerism set the stage for kind of going on this um, quest to an, a, a Quaker ideal um, place of Pennsylvania, a place where he could leave his mark and a place where he could, um, you know, make things work for himself. So I will, I will leave my, my formal talk there. Okay. Uh, thank you, Laura, uh, for that. Um, so we have, um, uh, we have uh, at least uh, 10 questions here at the minute. So if anyone has any questions uh, about uh, the talk or uh, did like uh, answered, uh, please just uh, use the Q&A button at the bottom and just uh, send it away and uh, we may go through them uh, now. Or you can uh, put your hand up as well uh, if you'd like to be on audio and uh, you'd like to hear your voice <laughs> over uh, uh, over Zoom. Uh, so, so Laura, the first question I have here, um, if James Logan had so many jobs, would he not be able to attend to his children? So, I mean, I think he did have children. <laughs> He did have children, yeah. Um, well, and it's interesting too because the children who survived ended up being, um, you know, thirteen years apart between the youngest and the eldest. So there's, I I still struggle sometimes to think about kind of developmentally what all of that's like when you have children of so many different ages and where did they all, we there was a, a nursery space actually at Stenton and, um, but how to what age did they they stay there? Um, but as far as I, I suppose our notions of um, 21st century fatherhood are probably quite different than 18th century ones. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, Logan had, um, I, di I didn't specifically say that he had both enslaved and indentured servants. And we do know that for the, um, from a, an account book actually that survives of, of his younger daughter, Hannah, that they had presumably women specifically designated as nurse who received, and it's in Hannah's um, little account book as if she's been given kind of an allowance that she gives money to the nurse herself. It's kind of it's interesting. Um, but I see that person as being kind of a, a, like a governess and the way the house is built, there's the nursery in one corner at Stenton and then the adjoining room, which we believe is a, a room that servant slept in and it makes the most sense that those would be, that would be an, a nurse's room or someone looking after children. So I don't think parenting um, is, it was certainly different. And even expectations of, of children uh, were, were quite different at the time. Okay. Um, so Jim, so Jim has put the Quakers are persecuted even in Lurgan, though protected by the landlord Brownlow. Yeah, so that feeds into your comment there about these horrors that he experienced at a childhood uh, that perhaps drove him uh, to Pennsylvania and to you know, secure a position where he'd be above that sort of persecution. It is. Yeah. Um, what did Patrick Logan do in Lurgan? So that's uh, James Logan's father. Yeah, my, was, uh, my understanding is that he was teaching school there as well, but I'm I, I'm not absolutely sure as much about, about Patrick. Maybe you can comment, David. Uh, there, there is a book, um, an, uh, like an Albert Meyer's book. Um, oh yeah, a, that, uh-huh. There's like a brief uh, biography um, of James Logan and it does mention that Patrick Logan was a Latin teacher in uh, Lurgan. Um, then uh, when he, he went to another Latin school when they left Ireland in the uh, late like 1680s. So, um, it's easy to see perhaps where James Logan got that passion, you know, you know for mm -hmm. classical civilization mm -hmm. there. Um, it's quite striking actually that there was a Latin school in Durgan, you know, in the, the uh, latter 17th century. You know, uh, it's uh, interesting, yeah. Well, um, I was just going to say, James Logan would, um, would help um, people like John Bartram learn their Latin so that they could participate in the botanical world. Was it? I heard read somewhere actually he was actually he could speak Hebrew as well. Is that true as well? Mm -hmm. he was. Geez. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Uh, Simon, as I written here, that uh, Waring House, um, yeah, Waringstein House, uh, which Logan would have known, has the same proportions as Stanton, so six windows over three floors. And actually, funny, yeah, I should have. Yeah, Waringstein's a village not too far from Lurgan, and uh, you know, uh, Waringstein House is, you know, it, it's it's uh, mud walled and it's a very historic house. So I have to send you over a few pictures, actually, Laura, of that. Uh, okay. Thanks, thanks, Simon, for pointing that out. Actually, I hadn't. Uh, I hadn't occurred, that should have occurred to me actually, uh, Warrenstein House, so yeah. It's amazing. Do you know, it's just, do, yeah. Does does Simon know when it was built? Uh, Simon, could you, uh, if you're there, uh, if you could maybe answer that. Um, I could look it up here on the net, but it, it, is late, it is late 17th century. Okay. Uh, or middle 17th century, so it's um, quite a spectacular house. Okay, we'll maybe come back to that one. Uh, Cynthia uh, asks, uh, hello, I might have missed it, but where does the name Lurgan come from? Does that relate to his place of birth or boyhood? Okay. Uh, where does the name Logan come from? Uh, Lurgan. Oh, where uh, does the name Lurgan <laughs> come from? Uh, so, so Cynthia, Lurgan uh, comes from a, an, an Irish word, uh, Lurgan. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm sure uh, Jim or somebody out there will correct me if, I, if I'm not. Uh, so Lurgan, uh, which means a uh, ridge or uh, sometimes shin-shaped uh, ridge. So Lurgan's actually built uh, on the ridge uh, with uh, buildings on either side. So on the map that uh, Laura showed earlier there, you'll just see the, the main street sort of stretches just, just uh, along this, this ridge. Uh, so, so Lurgan means ridge. And uh, I'm not sure where the word Logan comes from, but uh, you know, uh, I won't answer that since you haven't asked. <laughs> so, um, and she also asked, are there any good books you might recommend in James Logan's life? And it's interesting because when I was looking for books, I find it quite hard to actually find any. <laughs> yeah. So this Frederick Toll's biography, James Logan and the Culture of Provincial America, is is probably the best. Um, I I have had I have it it's sitting across the room from me, um, rather than right in front of me. Unfortunately, let me just I'll grab it real fast. Um, no worries. No worries. Okay, so Simon's come back to us there. So 1667, uh, Waringstein House was built. So yeah, um, I thank you, Simon, for that. But this is sort of a, a bound copy of um, a second edition, but the original edition is 1957. And that's Frederick Tolles, T-O-L-L-E-S, James Logan and the Culture of Provincial America. And then the other thing that I would definitely recommend particularly if you're interested in him's classical pursuits is um, whoops, this Edwin Wolf, who was the librarian at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Uh, the catalog of the library of James Logan has an excellent introductory essay. And then more, more generally sort of about Philadelphia merchants, but there's this meeting house and counting house, the Quaker merchants of colonial Philadelphia also by tolls. Okay, well, that's a that's a good to know actually. I'll have to see if uh, they're available actually here in the UK. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Cynthia. Um, we have a question here from anonymous. Um, did James Logan own slaves, and how is he regarded in Pennsylvania today? Okay. Yeah, he did. He did own enslaved people, and um, how is he regarded today? You know, I think he's kind of forgotten about, I think what kind of happened in effect and probably not that long after he died in a way is that the world changed a lot. And Benjamin Franklin, who was um, mentored by Logan, ultimately sort of carried um, the country, you know, through to the other side of the American Revolutionary War. And so often in Pennsylvania, we sort of think a lot about William Penn, the founder, and um, Benjamin Franklin, this sort of great worldly um, ambassadorial Philadelphian, who, like Logan, has that kind of curious scientific mind, but was a great self-promoter 
as part of his printing. And um, so he's, he's better known ultimately. And I think, um, and, and others have written that Logan's um, maybe curmudgeonly personality, his, his sort of abrupt personality could really put people off and um, you know, that he, he just may not be sort of fondly remembered. But there's a, one of the, Philadelphia was laid out by Penn with a central square and four squares. And over time, the squares were named Washington, Franklin, Rittenhouse, who's another founding person, and Logan. So, and that was turned into a square or a circle in the early 20th century as part of like a city beautiful movement parkway. But Logan is remembered. The name survives. His, his library is intact at the library company, although you could say he went and had it in its own individual building and, and that didn't... Um, it's almost like his books, he and his books were almost too erudite for um, the rest of America by 1780. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but he, he is remembered. But uh, I suppose in the context of all the stuff that we see at the minute, uh, po po political, uh, politically wise, would that have an impact on how you have to approach your sort of promotion of James Logan or anything like that? Oh, yeah. Um, well, we are doing um, a lot of work to, as I mentioned, that Dyna Memorial Project at the beginning, that actually bringing the Logan Memorial to the site just prompted us to, to think about her story because we steward, I didn't show pictures of this, but a plaque that was um, dedicated to her in 1912 because she saved the house. There's a, a, a longstanding, and, and we think much grounded in family truth story that she saved the house from burning by the British in 1777 during the American Revolution. And um, so we've been exploring this project to research her life so that she's more than just the heroine of the house. And I've learned quite a lot about how she brought her family together at Stenton in um, the era of James Logan's son, William, which is when she actually came to be at Stenton. Um, so we are, are doing research and putting, um, putting those stories out and, you know, training ourselves and to become comfortable talking about this very difficult part of American history. And I think for the healing of our country, um, it's imperative that we, we go there and we explore it in its fullness and its pain. Cause I think, I think it's, it's a genuine need. Um, Robert has asked, uh, did any Ulster Scots follow Logan to Pennsylvania? Um, there were many others that came after him, but I, I can't think of any, if, if the question is whether someone came because of him. Um, I feel like I've been reading so many um, little bits and pieces, David, that you've sent me recently. And there was something I read about another person whose name didn't mean a lot to me. And so I, I, it's not stuck in my head, but um, someone who is like a distant cousin of Logan's who specifically came to Philadelphia because um, Logan was there. And, and I just, I'm sorry, I cannot recall the name um, without wading through things. Would well, there have been quite a large sort of, uh, I know there was a few Quakers from Logan certainly made the journey to Pennsylvania as well as uh, Logan, but would there have been quite a large sort of Ulster sort of population or Irish population in Pennsylvania? Well, there did start to be more of an Irish population that um, settled on the frontier. And this caused a, actually quite a kind of um, a lot of trouble for even Logan as the colonial manager because um, he saw these people as sort of rough and crude and they were squatting on the land uh, and creating challenges with um, native relationships with Native Americans. And there's, there's a revolt that often ultimately happened. You can, if you Google sort of Paxton boys, um, P-A-X-T-O-N, you'll, you'll get a full history on all of that. Thank okay. you. Um, well, actually, the next question is, how did Logan get on with the Native Americans? 
<laughs> that's an <laughs> that's an interesting question too. And what you know, in the same way that I think um, a lot of public history practice is about building relationships, I think one of the other things that Stanton hopes to do is to form um, some relationships with members of the Lene Lenape tribe, the local Delaware Indians, um, who can work with us on some of this because actually um, Logan is, is seen as um, the orchestrator of what's sometimes called the largest land swindle in um, the early history of Pennsylvania in 1737. He orchestrated something called the walking purchase and I don't know how much detail you want to go into, but essentially um, the natives just ceded much more land than they thought they were agreeing to based on a kind of old agreement. And then Logan hiring runners to sort of run off much more um, acreage and, and distance than, um, than the Indians thought was going to be part of this walking purchase agreement for Logan. It was a running purchase agreement. Um, <laughs> So he, he clearly um, saw them as fellow human beings, but he was very interested in his kind of strategic territorial and colonial goals in his relationships with them. Um, but there's one story too, that the creek that runs, well, it's now an underground sewer in the city of Philadelphia, but the creek that runs through what was the plantation was called the Winga Hawking. And it came down through family lore again, that the creek got its name because Chief Winga Hawking and um, asked Logan as a sign of respect if they could exchange names. And Chief Winga Hawking actually did come to be known as Chief Logan and there were other Indians named Logan. Um, but Logan said, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm good with my name. Can, can I name my creek after you? And named the creek Winga Hawking, which sounds really terribly condescending, I think, in a way, <laughs> the, as an exchange. So I, I think that just says something about the way um, European settlers saw Native Americans um, and, and how they dealt with them. So it's said that Logan was a, is also a friend to the Indians, but, um, you know, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a challenging relationship, certainly. Would it be a fair characterization to say that Logan was a wee bit, uh, Logan done the dirty work of William Penn a wee bit? That'd be a... That is often said that um, Penn was the idealist with this vision for a kind of utopian Pennsylvania, this Quaker peaceful place, but it's so hard to be peaceful on planet earth. And there were other people already here, um, including the, the, um, the Swedes, um, had settled in the Delaware Valley earlier as well. And um, yeah, so that's that's often said that Logan was the pragmatist and Penn was the idealist. And there is a story in Franklin's autobiography um, that you could, could look up about Penn um, and Logan being on a ship and um, the ships being fired on and Penn and his family. Maybe this is even, I don't know if it is, the, it must be the Canterbury, but I, I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up again myself. Um, but they, the, the pens go down below and take cover and Logan stays up and mans a gun. And when it's all done and the danger is clear, Penn scolds Logan for, um, you know, stay, staying aboard above and, uh, and fighting. And Logan sort of says, you know, you were perfectly happy to let me fight when there was danger. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, I think that kind of says a lot. Yeah, yeah you need the pragmatism there indeed. Um, <laughs> actually, just following on from that, uh, there's a question from, uh, I can say, William Graham. Uh, what would Logan's responsibilities have been as secretary to William Penn? Um, you know, there's actually a whole list of things that, um, so when Penn goes, Penn returns to England in 1701 and doesn't come back again to Pennsylvania dying um, in 1718. And so he's doing things like collecting rent. Um, I wish I could, I had that handy that I could also count that to mind for you, but he is, he's really managing all the affairs of the colony. So it includes um, the native, managing the Native American relationships and um, 
but one of the big things he's doing actually is is collecting rents and he and Pennsylvania is never profitable for Penn so this creates a lot of headaches for Logan um, and his first return trip to England is in 1710 the same time that those um, Iroquois kings are so-called kings are in um, London and he's really trying at that point to sort of sort out some of the really kind of messy finances um, and I didn't mention that one of the ways he acquires ultimately over 18,000 acres of land in, in addition to um, uh, Stenton itself at, and, and so has this great sort of non-contiguous assemblage of land at the time of his death is that in 1710, he, because of, his, of knowing um, who owned all the land in Pennsylvania, he did go around in England and visit people who owned land but had no plan to come to Pennsylvania and purchase their land from him, from them. So this was, um, again, one of the ways that he kind of indirectly assembled, um, what, you know, longstanding wealth for his, his descendants. Okay. Um, just uh, sort of on that, uh, Jim, uh, could you elaborate a bit more on his political influence? So um, just how important a figure is James Logan in the history of Pennsylvania? Um, yeah, pretty much um, he was involved in just about everything that happened between 1700 and 1750 in, in one way or another. And um, so his influence was was both personal and political, you know, through mentoring people, but um, all kinds of the, the actions of, of running the government. Okay. And there, there is a lot of history of, of all that kind of early Pennsylvania um, stuff and, and times that he's more in power than, than others. And um, tolls is really probably your go-to um, source for, for a lot of that. Okay. Um, Katie has a sort of a uh, message us. Uh, so there's an antique dealer in Dublin called Johnson Antiques. He specialise in Irish Georgian furniture, and they may be able to advise you um, about the Irish design elements. So uh, Johnson, uh, did you say? Uh, Johnson Antiques, yeah. So we can okay. uh, get the address for you there. Okay. Um, just conscious or sort of, you know, uh, going over. So there's just some good questions here. So I sort of want to get as many as we can. Um, uh, so, thank you. So, what was happening at uh, Stanton uh, during the British occupation of Philadelphia during the American Revolution? That's from Denise. Yeah, it's actually kind of a, um, a transition point in Stanton's history because, um, well, James Logan died in 1751. His son, William, um, inherited the property, but William died in 1776, actually. So, kind of in the midst of of all the, no, did he, he actually died in 1777 in the midst of all, all of the, the battling that's going on. And so that story um, about Dinah saving the house is. Oh. Meant to have actually happened in November of 17 all by herself. But we have learned that um, James Logan's youngest son, um, J sort of James Jr., Jemmy, um, and um, Dr. George Logan, so the grandson generation, his brother Charles had not married yet. And so those two men, one older and one younger, were kind of around the plantation. But um, it also was used as an encampment um, prior to the, the Battle of Germantown for the British and their actually maps, um, I think it's in a, a, one of the royal collections that are quite good sketches of the property and where, where the encampments were out toward this Wingo Hawking Creek that I mentioned. Um, oh. So Washington stayed with the colonial was actually posted at Stenton in the, in the fall before the Battle of Germantown, which is quite close to us in, um, in October. Okay, um, you're breaking up a wee bit there, Laura. Uh, but, oh, uh, you're yeah, back. I saw something that said my internet connection was unstable. Yeah, um, maybe that's a signal for us, but I'll get another, <laughs> Maybe time to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get another couple of questions squeezed in here. So, okay. um, uh, was Logan a big influence on Benjamin Franklin and others among the founding fathers? 
Um, I, and the, was the question that was, it was in addition to Franklin, other founding fathers as well? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, of the people we consider to be the founding fathers, um, Franklin is the one that he had a, a, a direct relationship with. Um, you know, and like tends to happen when when someone becomes kind of old and feeble. There were there are letters where Logan, um, in toward the end of his life, he'd also had some strokes, and there's there are descriptions that he could be difficult to communicate with. Um, but he very much wants Franklin to come visit him. He misses him terribly, and um, clearly there was there was a time that they had at least a very kind of close relationship, but. Um, no, not that I, I can't think of anyone else that we consider a founding father that I would say he had any kind of direct relationship with. Okay. Um, what were Logan's scientific leanings? Was he a naturalist? Well, they, yeah, they science, called you know? all of science at the time sort of natural philosophy. Um, and it's not, and he, he wrote, um, he wrote a treatise actually that was um, private, privately published. I don't know that whether you'd be able to get your hands on it at all, but I could I could maybe do some poking around if you really wanted to read this. But it's a it's called the duties of man as they may be deduced from nature. Um, so he's a he's a great thinker and moralizer and philosopher. Um, but as far as science was concerned, he um, had a a solar microscope and, um, you know, he mentions maybe um, that he wants to build an observatory, which as I say, we're not totally sure exactly what that means or whether he did build it, um, but he has a telescope and he's, he's interested in how the world works and um, being around other people corresponds with the Royal Society. Um, and Peter Collinson is one of those people kind of how, how does the world work and let's, let's investigate this. And, um, and, to, and it's through his Atlantic connections that he's even able to, to participate in that. Okay. Um, two questions sort of similar, so I'll just combine them. So uh, okay. from, from Patty Beckin and William Graham. So as a stenting curator, do you keep an inventory of Logan's property not in the stenting collection? Is yes. It part of, is it part of your responsibilities to acquire them for Stanton's collection? Um, Patty's question is, are there any other Native American artifacts from the several encampments they had at Stanton, or did he receive any wampum? So that's a that's a, the the artifacts question. We have, um, and this is in a way more of an eighteen um, sort of eighteen teens artifact, but we have a tiny little box made of elm wood of this of this tree called the Treaty Tree, which is supposed to be this great tree under which William Penn, you know, promised the Indians love and friendship forever in 1682. And um, inside that little box is a bead of wampum. So we have this tiny little bead of wampum in our, um, in our collection as a, as a relic of the essentially related to this treaty and um, 19th century, particularly Quaker Philadelphians, um, really relish that romantic notion of Pennsylvania as this, this, you know, peaceful place and what that piece of wampum would represent about love and friendship. Um, and we have that redware bowl that I showed you that is not a native artifact, but talks about it, uh, about relationships and representations of natives and representing an agreement that took place in 1710. Um, and then the other thing that, that comes to mind is that we have these artifacts called jaw harps in our, our um, archaeological collection, which actually the, the part that's missing is like a little sort of, it's a twangy kind of thing. You'd put it in your mouth and kind of, it makes music. If you Google it, you can find videos of people playing them, but they're associated um, in multiple contexts. So sometimes they're associated with enslaved people, but Logan did send them in large quantities as trade goods to his store at Conestoga, which is in, in more sent, um, west of Philadelphia, Lancaster County area. Um, so it's possible that the, we could associate those also with, with Native Americans. Um, 
Okay. But yeah, it's not like it's not like going to visit Thomas Jefferson's Monticello where he actually collected Native American artifacts. And I think it actually says a lot that Logan dealt with actual living, breathing Native Americans. They were a, a dying people, largely, or a transplanted people by the time that Jefferson was um, at Monticello. And he's therefore collecting essentially in his, you know, almost like relics of or natural history collections of Native Americans. And I just follow on William Graham's question about do you keep an inventory of Logan's property not in the Stanton collection? We do. And that's actually one of the most fun parts of my job in a way because things um, turn up. And just recently, um, a sort of empty clock case has turned up in the Independence Park collection that because of this, um, antiquarian in the early 19th century has a really good Logan provenance. It's a really small version of a tall clock. And so we're, we're hoping we may be able to borrow that too. And so we don't always have things just in our collection. We do borrow. And the, the one other gentleman merchant that I showed, Isaac Norris, and I showed the marriage certificate between their children. And I didn't go into great detail, but um, the families would intermarry twice in the 18th century, which means that a lot of the family objects are also Norris objects. And we aren't always sure. So we, we do believe we have a lot of Logan and Norris artifacts at Stanton. Excellent. Um, did Logan design Stanton or was there a known architect? There's no architect. And this is a, a kind of, um, you know, I hesitate maybe to totally land on this word, but the method of, of building buildings like this is vernacular in the sense that it's kind of carried in the minds of the craftspeople who have built other buildings like it before. Um, but there's an aspect of Stenton where it's very clear that Logan must have been particular about kind of the plan, these big rooms across the second floor. The staircase was probably adjusted to make it work better and more boldly as part of um, during the, the process of construction. So it may not have been kind of the exact stair want, Logan wanted and it was adjusted. So I can imagine he made sketches, particularly because we have the sketch he drew for his idea of a library, but um, no, none survive. Um, for the house and and it's in the 1760s that are some in our region are some of the first kind of architectural sketches for houses do survive um so it's it's not architect design but logan did own architecture books he had vitruvius and he had um a gentleman's architectural dictionary the city and country purchasers dictionary by richard neve so he had this he could look up all kinds of details of, of what a gentleman's house should have in it um, and how it might be formed. Yeah, so one of those, stir away, one of those, yeah. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Bernie O'Neill asks, um, is there anything to suggest that Logan would have been involved in the slave trade? Oh yes, he, he definitely, insofar as he was clearly purchasing people for himself, um, but it does not appear from the ledger books that he was purchasing great volumes of people and then buying and selling um, humans as a commodity other than for kind of his own um, ownership. Okay. Uh, but I think you can, you can call him a slave trader, absolutely. Okay, yeah, there's so many sides uh, to him, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the garden? I'm Miss, okay, so uh, Marjorie Hoffman. Yeah. yeah, so I mentioned that we do have a colonial revival garden as part of the, the historic site today. And that was actually created by the colonial dames in 1911. Um, one of them was a woman named Letitia Wright who lived near to Stenton and was herself a Logan descendant. And she hired her cousin, a man named John Casper Wister, who was a newly minted Harvard landscape architect and they worked together so that he designed a screen for this sort of two and a half acre property that surrounded the um, the house from this larger Stenton Park in a neighborhood that was rapidly urbanizing an industrial neighborhood that had really changed 
And so he was um, interested, they, they were interested in, in sort of screening the house and creating this little oasis for it. And then he laid out a um, formal garden of beds and Letitia Wright and her garden committee um, planned out kind of what plants would go into it. And Letitia did a lot of research in Logan papers so that um, she recorded what James Logan and William Logan were both um, collecting and growing. And so we even today stick to the, the genuses and try to have older varieties of those plants in the garden and follow Letitia's. She had a color scheme, like a rainbow color scheme for the, for the borders. But perhaps the most striking part of the garden, and we hope we can continue to keep these alive, are these now kind of 100 and almost 110 year old boxwood that have gotten quite large. They were meant to be small little edge plants for the beds. And they now create a massive sort of frame for the garden. Okay. Um, I just asked about the colonial dams for America. Uh, uh, what is, how are they? <laughs> Why? I can't put any more. <laughs> so they are a, a women's lineage based organization that was founded in 1891 um, that have a, a three part um, mission of preservation, education and community service. And um, so they took on Stenton as their their preservation and education project and um in and so have through administering historic sites is is one of the ways that they fulfill their mission but to join there's a there's a process and there's what's called the register of ancestors and so people trace their lineage to a, a kind of early ancestor who has who provided service in in the early colonies and that ancestor register actually is often expanding pocahontas is now um, an ancestor and um, so it is it is not quite the same sleepy organization that maybe it sounds like it's actually a really pretty dynamic group but it is an, an all women's um, service organization okay well, I think it's uh, nine o'clock here. I'm not sure what it is in America. <laughs> so, <laughs> Almost four. Or no, Almost. Four, it is four. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, that went on a bit good, but some really good questions there. And uh, the more you talk about Logan, the more angles there are to him. And you could probably have a talk about different aspects of his character, but uh, certainly a very uh, complex uh, and interesting um, um, but uh, Laura, I just want to thank you for joining us uh, today. Uh, really, oh, really you're welcome. I really appreciate it. It's nice getting a, a transatlantic tech. Uh, it is. We can have our own <laughs> cross-Atlantic life. <laughs> <laughs> that is, and I certainly would like to keep in contact with you. I know I've already been talking about a few education projects. We can maybe do you know, some of the schools and stuff uh, from uh, Lurgan to Philadelphia. Um, if you want to uh, learn more about Stanton or um, uh, keep up to date, you can uh, like Stanton on Facebook. And I, I, I know you hold uh, Facebook live talks and things like that as well. Um, and, uh, or you can follow them on, or you can uh, look up their website at stanton.org as, as well. Um, just, just to say on behalf, uh, thank you everyone for coming. I re really appreciate you taking the time. Um, We'll be holding a few more online events. That is, we, the Lurgan Townscape Heritage, will be holding a few more online events over the, the next few months. If you want to be kept up to date with them, uh, just uh, give our Facebook page a like or just email myself and we can add you to the book and uh, our mailing list and uh, you'll be informed about all the events we have coming up. So thank you once again. Uh, thank you, David. It. No worries. Uh, thank you. And also to Rachel, he's in the background there, and uh, Tony as well for you know moderating everything. So. Uh, if you have any questions or anything you'd like to ask, uh, just email myself and I can pass them on to you, Laura. I'm sure I'll be happy enough to follow up on any questions people may have. So uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, good uh, night or good afternoon or good evening, depending <laughs> on where you are, <laughs> are in the world. All right. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.